Two years ago, Thomas Frank made the seemingly crazy decision to abandon his 2 million subscriber YouTube channel that he spent a decade of his life building to make software tutorials. I wanted to create a destination that people immediately thought of as the go-to place to learn Notion. I wanna make software tutorials so good looking that people are like, why would he put this much effort into it? This is stupid. His decision paid off big time. The Thomas Frank Explains channel has grown to 220,000 subscribers, done over 10 million views, and doubled his revenue just by teaching people how to use the productivity and note-taking software, Notion. In this episode, you'll learn how to design the perfect viewer experience, I wanted to have this experience where people find a video, they click over to the channel and they realize like, I want to learn Notion and this is the place for it. How to think about browse views versus search views. I naively thought that TF Explains was going to be a search only channel. That turned out to be wrong. Actually, I, we have more traffic from browse features and suggest than we do from search. The pros and cons of relying on outside platforms for success. You're never gonna get to space by riding a bicycle you built yourself. And what every person starting a tutorial channel needs to do. Don't worry about the strategy, just make what you're interested in and put it up on YouTube. It's been probably a year, more than a year, since we first recorded on the channel. Mm -hmm. I wanna hear how you're thinking about your YouTube strategy generally right now. And I'm gonna leave it that open and ambiguous. I have to give some context because my YouTube strategy is being informed by a bigger strategy. And that is that we are launching a new startup. We are calling it Flylighter. And it is starting out as the best web clipper for Notion, but eventually will be just the best idea capture and knowledge capture tool that you've ever seen that also lets you take things uh, from the web or from your head and get them into whatever app you're using instead of it being an app where you browse that data. So that makes my strategy change quite a bit because for the past year, couple of years, I've been almost entirely focused on teach Notion sell Notion templates, be like the king of that niche. Well, now we're kind of taking the next logical step in building a tool that serves those users, but then we also have to build brand affinity and uh, awareness for the tool itself. So rather than just relying on Notion content to do that, I'm launching my main channel again. And I don't just want to make productivity content again, but I realize that there is a very strong strategic reason to create productivity content. There's still stuff I want to teach around that. So we're going to be doing some more productivity videos uh, that may not just feature Notion as the app I talk about. And then uh, I think I also want to, you know, give myself permission to talk about some of the things that I am interested in and have developed skills in over the past couple of years on the channel, like building my no-code skills, even my coding skills, uh, talking a bit about business and entrepreneurship. And I think people like Ali Abdal have sort of demonstrated that once you've built up that affinity around your own personal brand, the audience is interested in the things that you are doing as well. It was kind of like a ref refreshingly simple goal to have in the past of just like, I want to become the recognized personality and expert for this growing tool that isn't mine. Now things are more difficult because we're trying to balance that with also building up our own startup and, and building brand affinity around that. I was jealous of the simplicity of that goal. I was like, man, what's, <laughs> what's my thing? I just want to do the one thing. I thought, I thought it was great. I feel like there's grass is greener syndrome with that, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, because I feel jealousy around that with uh, our mutual friend, Justin Welsh, who basically has his singular thing uh, being solopreneurship. I'm over here with like, well, I've got my singular thing, it's Notion, but boy, that thing over there is like singular, but also applies to a lot of different things. Whereas like mine is a specific tool and I have to convince people they wanna like learn about formulas in that tool. So there's, you know, strengths and weaknesses, no matter what niche you're in, no matter what sort of balance you have with uh, regard to broad versus narrow focus. Uh, so it's funny to hear you say like, you have experienced that kind of same jealousy because I feel it with Justin. Help us understand why you split in the first place. Mm -hmm. Why create Thomas Frank Explains versus produce the Notion content on the main channel? The main idea here is I wanted to create a destination that people immediately thought of as the go-to place to learn Notion. For me, it wasn't necessarily about how was the algorithm gonna see this content because we've probably talked about this in the show before. The algorithm doesn't necessarily... Uh, penalize your entire, cha your entire channel for having variety content. It'll just sort of push out the content that people want to see to those people, and then the rest of it might just not get pushed out. But it was more a perception play more than anything else. I wanted to have this experience where people find a video, they click over to the channel, and they realize, like, I want to learn Notion, and this is the place for it. 
And if it's on the main channel mixed in with a bunch of general productivity content, it's not going to sell that perception quite as fast. It's not gonna set that first impression. The other thing was, on the flip side, the main channel was supposed to be productivity tips, life advice, personal finance, like all that more general stuff. So if I have a video, it's like, here's how to change your URL handler for a Notion link and then put it into a shortcut. Like nobody cares about that. It's super niche. So uh, again, it's just like, it's all semantics. It's all taxonomy at the end of the day. But I thought it was going to be the best strategic decision for building the perception. When you create uh, videos on the main channel versus Thomas Frank Explains, are you thinking about the way views will happen differently? Because I would think that on Thomas Frank Explains, we're doing a lot of tutorials. Is the strategy for a tutorial video the same as the strategy for a more generalized productivity video on the main channel? I don't think so. And I have to speak from my experience here more than my plans for the future, because the main channel's goals are gonna be different going forward. But for the past six, seven years, uh, I've had sponsorships on the main channel. So there was very much a, we wanna see good conversions within the first 30 days, Thomas, <laughs> sort of like pressure hanging over my head. So there was very much like a, we wanna see uh, good performance views wise in the early days of the video. On TF Explains, originally I did not care about the views at all. In fact, uh, I naively thought that TF Explains was gonna be a search only channel and it would never get any sort of organic promotion in the homepage or the browse features. Uh, that turned out to be wrong. Actually, I, we have more traffic from browse features and suggested than we do from search, but those videos are very, very long tail. I've seen multiple times videos that start out as like a 10 out of 10 eventually become one of the higher performing videos on the channel. I think our Notion databases tutorial was like that. It was a 10 out of 10 for the first week or two. And now it's like maybe sixth or seventh from the top. It has nearly 300,000 views, which is great for the Notion niche. So yeah, it's more just like, a, I'm gonna put out an evergreen piece of content or as evergreen as it can be with a, a tech app that changes a lot. And I'm just gonna let it do its thing. It's just another, it's like another piece of the library that forms the channel. Whereas on the main channel, I don't really feel like there's like a, like a specific library I'm building. It almost feels like I'm constructing a textbook on Thomas Frank Explains. And on the long tail videos on Thomas Frank Explains, does that long tail come from search or is that just YouTube getting better at recommending to specific viewers who it thinks the time is right for them to learn this thing? Uh, I actually don't think I've checked about the long tail specifically uh, split. What I do know about the algorithm is it will continually try new audience out, new audience segments out over time, even as the video becomes older and older. And that's why you will often see random spikes in your videos, sometimes months and months after the fact. And a lot of creators are like, where the heck did that come from? Sometimes it was just like the algorithm finally found the right pocket for this video. Because you've had some very, very specific videos, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think about your, your fairly recent video about how I use AI to take perfect notes without typing. Uh, over 600,000 views on a long tutorial that seems like a very specific thing that somebody would want to do. And mm -hmm. it's just really awesome that this level of like, I know that started for you as just this curiosity, can I do this for me that you spent like what? days on, maybe weeks on getting to oh, work. Oh, not, not days or weeks, months. <laughs> <laughs> that Crazy. video, I mean, and I just published a new one uh, that's unfortunately not doing as well. In fact, maybe we could talk about why I shot myself in the foot with the newest video, but I spent like an additional three months working like nights and weekends, often full days sometimes, uh, making a much better version of that workflow that's like very plug and play. It, it takes the setup time from like half an hour down to five minutes for the user. It's much easier. So I'm thinking like, oh, it's going to be another viral hit. No, it's, it's not doing nearly as well. Uh, and I think part of the reason is maybe it's the, the AI hype is down down a little bit, but uh, I think I really shot myself in the foot by being like, hey, there's a full guide that I wrote for all three versions of this workflow, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox. And uh, I've noticed that the watch time on that video is really low. <laughs> so I think it's people mm. going, oh, the written guide is even easier than the video. Let me just click on that and leave the video. Mm. Interesting. So like, there's almost like this, hmm, maybe I should have waited until the end to tell people there was a written guide and just had them sit through the tutorial. Yeah, do you see, do you see that in the retention curve? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's like the most clear cut case between, uh, between like serving the audience is a bad thing for retention in this video's case. And I almost wonder if it 
like if it literally worked out better to be a kind of pain in the butt tutorial the first time. After a quick break, we talk about how big of a role the software itself plays in your channel's success. So stick around, we'll be right back. This video is sponsored by Notion, the most essential tool in my business. I know that's a bold statement, but it's absolutely true. All of my notes, projects, tasks, experiments, and research for this channel is done right inside Notion. If you're not using Notion yet, I encourage you to give it a try. Their personal plan is free, and it's one of the best free products on the market. Recently, they rolled out Notion Calendar, which is a productivity nerd's dream come true. It brings your docs, notes, and project dates into your calendar. You can search and connect Notion docs directly to events so everything lives in the same place and you have all the context that you need. If you're a Google Calendar user like me and you get nervous about making a big switch, it actually integrates with Google Calendar so you can try it out risk-free before making a full commitment. Now, I'm actually on a paid Notion plan because I want access to all the newest AI functionality. Their newest feature is called Q&A and it's an absolute game changer. Think of Notion as your second brain and Notion Q&A as an on-demand assistant familiar with everything in that second brain. Instead of trying to remember where some piece of information is stored, you just ask Notion Q&A and it sweeps through all of your documents and returns a specific answer and the related pages where that information was found. Using Notion Q&A is like having a conversation with your data. It saves you so much time and reduces the stress of making sure you organize everything perfectly. And if you collaborate with a team, this makes it much easier for them to find information, even if they don't know how everything is organized. Q&A is included in all existing Notion AI subscriptions. You can get started with Notion AI for only $10 a month. And if you're already a Notion AI user, you can get started today with Q&A already in your Notion workspace. To find out more or give Notion a try for free, just visit the link in the description. I'm thinking about the role of the platform you choose. How, how big of a role do you think Notion being the tool that you chose played in this channel's success? A big role, I think. I would describe this as a symbiotic relationship. Part of why Notion is so successful and continues to grow, uh, to grow is kind of like that Ikea effect. It gives people this basically set of Legos to play with, and that makes people really proud of what they build and they want to go share it. So Notion is in this very enviable position where it has a very passionate user base that is constantly talking about it, constantly creating free content about it. Uh, and then they've they've developed this even more enviable position where creators have realized, uh, as in my case, you can literally sell what you've created. So that now further incentivizes people like me and other Notion creators to constantly talk about Notion, not just our products, but also their product in general, because that helps to build up our audiences. I think if I had picked a tool that was sort of on the decline in terms of user base, maybe this is unfair, but I'll just pick Asana out of the air. Um, I don't know if Asana has quite that cultural interest right now. I don't know if it's growing in quite the same way, uh, especially from a large user base perspective. So I'm not sure that I would have been able to grow to the same same levels. However, uh, as I'm thinking about this, I do want to bring up a, a counterpoint, and that is uh, another channel called The Coda Guy. Now, I think Coda is not in the same boat as Asana. It's a newer app. It does have a growing user base. It is much more niche, does not have quite the same following as Notion. So when you go look at The Coda Guy's channel, it's not quite as big. He doesn't usually break 10K views on a video, but he's on track to make like half a million dollars this year in revenue. Wow. And I think a lot of what he's doing is like consulting, helping companies build up their internal Coda docs. So instead of selling like a $50 template, it might be like a $5,000 consulting session or something like that. I'm not quite sure. But yeah, he has found similar financial success in covering a tool that doesn't have sort of like the same media attention as Notion. In like venture capital investing, there's this, this idea of platform risk. Mm -hmm. Like is the thing that you're building on top of another thing. So there are potential existential risks to, your th risks to your thing based on that thing. Do you think about platform risk or should somebody watching this who's thinking about making their own tutorials channel, how should they think about platform risk? I do think about it a lot, actually. Uh, just yesterday, Notion had downtime. And I was just like, well, yeah, this is annoying because <laughs> our products don't work and people are buying our products and can't use them. And we have to email them, be like, hey, try again later. It's you know not really us. To a degree, I think there's a lot of platform risk, even if you're not covering one tool. Like I have platform risk on YouTube. I think if that went away, I don't know how much I'd be able to leverage Twitter <laughs> to get the same results. I kind of think about this like a rocket ship. 
So like if you want to get to space, you need a lot of fuel, a lot of thrust, a lot of power. And that means you have to rely on the work of a lot of other people. And then you get up there and eventually have to jettison parts of the rocket. You're never going to get to space by riding a bicycle that you built yourself. I love that. So <laughs> yeah, I guess like the philosophy here is like platform risk is a necessary evil, but it also often functions as like rocket fuel for a business. And so your job as an entrepreneur is to constantly survey the landscape, to constantly sort of do that like SWOT analysis on your business, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and uh, threats, and, and, and decide, you know, kind of on a moment to moment basis, like how much platform risk is acceptable right now? Should I be diversifying or should I be totally buckling down? I think there was like an Alex Hermosi tweet a while ago. This was like, this is stuck in my head a lot. He said, you don't get rich by diversifying. You stay rich by diversifying. You typically get rich by striking it out of the park on one really big thing. So a lot of opportunities we have these days are building one really big thing on top of uh, another platform. And it's just part of the risk that you uh, take on as an entrepreneur. You know, that's what we do. We take risks, right? I've always had this, what I think is probably an irrational fear of creating videos around a tool or even even if just part of the video features a tool because I worry that even changes in the UI of just how it looks will frustrate me to know someday like the thing that is shown in that video is no longer the way things look. Mm. That has to have happened so many times in the course of doing uh, Notion tutorials. What's your relationship to uh, platform changes mm -hmm. that... Uh, you know, relate to videos that you've made in the past. I'm going to tell a philosophical story to hit, to kick this one off. <laughs> when I was a college student, uh, one year, these Buddhist monks came to our college and they set up a gigantic round table in our big Memorial Union area. They spent an entire week very carefully pouring this like finely colored sand to create what's called a mandala. It's this beautiful piece of sand art that takes them five full days, eight hours a day, just pouring sand to create. And so they make this. And then when it's done, they do a little ceremony and they sweep it away. And it's basically an exercise in appreciating the ephemerality of life. I bring that story up because that is the mindset that I have tried to adopt when it comes to making content about tech. There is no such thing as permanence. Uh, and I think on the internet, we can convince ourselves that if we pick the right niche, we do get permanence and we can create this evergreen content that's just never going to go away. Uh, but the fact is, even if you pick something that is like, if you're talking about stoic philosophy, right? I can go talk about Marcus Aurelius all day long. And then next year, Ryan Holiday is going to make a better video and mine's outmoded. And I need to go make a new video because the meta shifted. So there's, there's just no such thing as uh, permanence. And I have accepted that as somebody who makes content about Notion. Eventually, I'm going to have to completely reshoot Notion fundamentals. I'm going to have to completely reshoot my uh, tutorials for my products. And I just embrace that. It kind of sucks. Like, it does get frustrating sometimes, especially when it's like a small change, but it's important. But, you know, that's just sort of the trade-off that I accept for getting to create content every day about a tool that I'm a huge nerd about. How do you vet what you create videos around then? Because I imagine like you're doing so much stuff all the time. How do you decide like what is too specific and nerdy? Is there a too specific and nerdy? Is that actually a pro? So I will say, despite my online veneer of business strategy mogul or whatever people want to call me, <laughs> my primary driver for what I make is what I'm interested in. This can often lead to me making a two hour video about the Notion API. It can lead to me making like spending three months programming something and then releasing a video where I accidentally kill the watch time. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, there is some strategy. And I think it is especially clear for Thomas Frank Explains. I know who I'm serving. I'm serving people who want to learn Notion. So there are things that just need to be in the online video textbook that is that channel. There needs to be a video on the API. There needs to be a video on um, database features. There needs to be a video on, on just building pages and linking, all that kind of stuff. In many cases, you can literally just go into your YouTube analytics and see what your viewers are searching for. They have that research tab in analytics, and you can see where your content gaps are. On the main channel, you have this cinematic 
aesthetic uh, in the videos, in the thumbnails. On Thomas Frank Explains, these aren't cinematic videos. This is not the word I would use for them. How do you think about production, like fidelity, B-roll, all these different things that you probably spend a lot more time thinking about on the main channel than you do in Thomas Frank Explains? Yeah, so Thomas Frank Explains had a very, very strong mission from the get-go. And I think that really helped me to get clear on what needed to be prioritized and what didn't. If people are coming to a video with the intent of learning how to build a task manager in Notion, they probably don't need 120 frame per second slow-mo B-roll of me drinking coffee in it. They just need a good looking video that primarily sounds good and makes very clear what needs to be accomplished and what they're going to get at the, the end of it. That sort of led me to making the decision early on that a lot of TF Explains was going to be very templated. I'm going to stand in front of my camera, 60 frames per second, make a bunch of facial expressions and get a folder of thumbnail poses I can use forever. I'm going to use the same color background for every thumbnail. Uh, I have the same bundle of assets. Every thumbnail is going to have the Notion logo in it. That's just, it's just what it is. And that made thumbnail creation way, way easier. For fidelity, I did have this sort of egocentric, but I think sort of strategic goal of, I want to have the best looking software tutorials ever made. I want to make software tutorials so good looking that people are like, why would he put this much effort into it? This is stupid. <laughs> so that's why I'm sitting in like a thousand square foot studio <laughs> with all this stuff around me. It's just like, I, I, I wanted to do that just to see if I could do it. But also I think it's going to make people talk. And then beyond that, it's just like, Make sure that everything is clear. I have a lot of uh, UI, UX, graphic design experience from over the years that helped me figure out like how much should we zoom the screen in? When should we actually do a full zoom in? Should we highlight the mouse, show the keystrokes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, on the main channel, there was never a super specific mission, right? Like it started as this is the College Info Geek channel. I'm gonna teach people how to be awesome at college. And there's a lot to that, grades, career fairs, extracurriculars, everything, relationships. And then that morphed into, well, now I'm older, I guess I'm teaching the same kind of tactics and techniques, but to people who are not in a defined four year period of their life. So now it's even more general. Every video is helpful, but every video is almost like a standalone project. So that sort of brought the focus down from channel level to video level and made me focus a lot more on the artistic elements of each video and making it like a unique work. But we also have more defined goals as far as the business goes. I still have things I wanna do on TF Explains. I wanna build Flylighter. I have like a startup to, to market. So we're probably gonna see less like mountain lake videos and a little bit more of that. Let's create a show format so we can uh, better highlight the lessons we're trying to teach instead of focusing on slick B-roll and cool animations and stuff. Yeah, I highlight that because I think it's an opportunity for people. A lot of times when I talk to aspiring YouTubers, they get really caught up in production and aesthetics and all these features that make something look and sound really, really great. But mm -hmm. when you when you're focused, when the when the goal of the video is actually knowledge transfer and uh, comprehension, you know, it seems like that set of considerations is secondary to accomplishing the goal, which is really good knowledge capture which I, or knowledge transfer, which I think is a, a really helpful starting point for folks who are really interested in doing tutorials or doing uh, in-depth breakdowns on something very specific. Yeah, the more specific you go, uh, I would say the less work you have to do to sort of like convince a viewer to click, convince a viewer to sit down and keep watching. It's not to say there is nothing you can do, but if somebody's like, I really want to manage my tasks in Notion. I don't know how to build a task manager. And then my video pops up. It's like, masterclass, how to build a task manager in Notion from scratch. I don't have to do a lot of work to convince that viewer to click the video. They already want that. I just presented them exactly what they want. And from there, I just need to show them how to build it. Whereas if it's like, we're gonna do a video on, uh, you know, how to get out of a rut or, or like how to, yeah, how to get out of a creative rut or something like that. Um, that is almost, I don't know if it's like too broad, but it's much broader than I need to use specific software tool to get specific result. So making it almost like a, let's sit down and watch this as my lunchtime video versus anything else I could choose. Uh, that comes more into play. For people who are watching this and they're like, okay, I have tools I like, I have things that I'm interested in. I think I might want to play around with doing a tutorials channel. Anything else we haven't covered that you think they should think about or be aware of if they're going to do uh, a tutorials channel? 
the main thing I would say is most people listening to this probably aren't yet creating content or they're not doing it consistently. So don't worry about the strategy. Just make what you're interested in and put it up on YouTube. And also don't worry too much about the individual results because again, you're if you're creating an entire channel that is a tutorial channel for either a specific tool or a specific purpose, like say graphic design or UX, you're creating a library of content and you can always remake videos. And if you make a video, then your ability to remake it in the future and, and make it 10,000 times better is gonna be there because you've gotten the first rep in. Beyond that, uh, I think a lot about content pillars on Thomas Frank Explains. So I have like the fundamentals pillar, which is like somebody wants to learn how to use Notion. So that's all the Notion fundamentals videos from the basics of creating pages all the way up through databases. Then I have like the build guides and tutorials pillar. That's like the task manager tutorial, the tutorial on building a habit tracker, personal portfolio website on Notion. Those are typically, I think uh, if you take outliers out, those are typically the most successful videos on the channel long-term because they actually teach an outcome that people want. Whereas the fundamentals is like, here's how to use the tool. It's almost like a, um, you know, here, like here's how to speak French versus here's how to like actually go to France and, and have a great life there, that kind of thing. I also have like the feature releases. So this is a big thing. Notion is very communicative with their ambassadors about new releases. So we all make content about those new releases as if they're tech videos. Those videos do really well in the short term, tend to peter off after a month or so, which is totally fine. Um, but they are a great way to bring in new interest to the channel and sort of solidify your channel as a destination to do information about the tool when new features release. And then I have like your typical like 10 mistakes people make when they start using Notion or 10 ways to make Notion faster, like your kind of popcorn content. That would be like the fourth uh, pillar, I would say. I love that. I love the idea of I want this to be the destination for people to learn this content, because I think if you have that goal in mind, even if you don't see the results and analytics that you hope to early on, you can ask yourself intellectually, is this serving that goal? Because I think in the beginning, probably especially on a channel like this, where maybe recommended won't be as fast to hit if you're doing a very specific tutorial, you need to have a long-term view and really be willing to invest the time to creating the videos. Hopefully one of them hits, but if you're hitting that goal of, is this making this the best channel on this topic? I think you can know you're doing the right things before you may see the results. Hey, if you're publishing content, but you aren't really making any money doing it, then I've got something for you. Check out my free professional creator crash course. In just a few days, I'll teach you how to earn a living as a professional creator. Just click the link in the description. Oh, and I, I will say there's one more pillar. I didn't think about this, but with the AI voice video that came out a few months ago, that video went through multiple rounds of feedback with my friends and colleagues over at Nebula. We have like a whole feedback channel on our Slack, which is probably the best thing we, we offer. Originally, my idea with that video was to call it like how I take notes with my voice in Notion with ChatGPT or something like that. We went through a bunch of different thumbnail revisions for that idea. And then my agent, Dave, pops in the chat and just says one thing. Would this be useful for people who don't use Notion? And I'm like, well, yeah, because you get to just talk to your phone, record a voice note, and it becomes perfect transcript and summary. It just happens to be using Notion as the note-taking tool. But yeah, I guess a lot of people would like that even if they weren't using Notion. So we pivoted. I didn't put Notion in the packaging at all. Thumbnails, just perfect notes, no typing, me holding up my phone with a note behind it. And then the title is how I take notes or how I use uh, AI to take notes with my voice without typing or something like that. But no, no mention of Notion. That's the video that now has 600,000 views. I think it's top three or four on the channel. And that sort of acts as a wider net that is cast that brings in a bunch of people interested in this certain outcome and then introduces Notion as the tool to help them solve that problem and get that outcome. Uh, and I remember noticing that Zapier was very good at this type of marketing with their SEO strategy. So for people who don't know, Zapier is automation tool, like a no code automation tool where you can sort of connect APIs together. So like uh, I got a new, Google Forms submission, and now it sends me an email. That's what you can do with Zapier. All of their content is like the best email apps in 2021, or the best to-do apps in 2021, or um, you know, here's how to manage your calendar. Like very, very broad, because they're going to get a certain percentage of people who are interested in those broader topics, who also are gonna be like, well, I really wanna connect my Google Calendar up to my Notion for some reason. Oh, I can use Zapier to do that. 
So there is a sort of like fifth developing pillar on TF Explains of creating these sorts of videos like the AI voice notes video that bring in people who may not, might not even use Notion or even know about it yet, but then will be introduced to the tool in the video about this really cool, broader thing that they're interested in. So smart, especially if someone's choosing a relatively new tool that may not have name recognition yet, which mm-hmm. I think is a good last question. If I'm thinking about the strategy of creating a channel around a tool, do you think that I need to be concerned about uh, first mover advantage or is it better to choose a tool that already has some momentum? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if it matters. <laughs> I'm kind of doing both. I would say with Notion, I was not first mover. Um, maybe I was one of the first big YouTubers to create like a mainstream video on it on the main channel. But in terms of like building TF Explains, August Bradley already had a ton of content. Marie Poulin already had a ton of content. Uh, Red Gregory already had some content. I was definitely not the first player. Uh, but the cool thing is like Notion has a growing audience. So there's a growing subset of that audience who wants to hear from someone like me and likes my style. Uh, there's also subsets of the audience that want to hear about the topics and subtopics I've chosen to cover that maybe August Bradley or Marie Poulin didn't really cover already. I'm not sure that they had like how to build a simple task manager on their channels. So I did that and my video did really well. Uh, They have other videos that talk about other things and their videos did really well for that. So I don't think it matters too much. If there's a growing audience for something and you're passionate about it and you're building skill in that area, that's a a good spot to be in, regardless of whether or not there are other players. To learn how you can master the YouTube algorithm like Thomas, check out this other interview I did with him where we talk about how he built his first channel to 2 million subscribers.